to Jerusalem, and there was these ten people with leprosy. And they were like, Jesus, please heal me. And Jesus said he did. He healed them. But only one of them came back to give him praise and thanksgiving. And if we enter this week of thanksgiving, we often forget that it's just a day of thanksgiving, but it's not every day that we should give him thanks. It's an attitude of gratitude because of what he's done for us, because he is the good, good father, and how he loves us and he cares for us. So as we enter this week, just remember that, that not just this week we give him thanks, but every day that we see his goodness with us. Psalms 92, verses 1 through 2 says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to the Most High. It is good to proclaim your unfailing love in the morning and your faithfulness in the evening. So let's just give him praise this morning and go to him with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we can come to your house, Lord, and gather together. And we just thank you that we can give you the praise for all the good you do to us, Lord. We thank you that you love us, you care for us, you forgive us, and you provide for us, Lord. So, Lord, as we enter this week of Thanksgiving, Lord, we pray, Lord, that we will always be reminded to be that one that comes back to praise you, Lord, for everything you do for us, Lord, to give you the glory and honor that you deserve, Lord. We ask, Lord, she would move in this house this morning in a mighty way, Lord. She would touch each and every person individually, Lord. And whatever they're going through, you know it, Lord. And I pray, Lord, she would walk them through it, Lord. And we give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's sing this thing this morning.
word says that we are his and that we are who he says we are.
Jesus, I'm so thankful for the blood that sets us free, washes us clean, and gives us a home in heaven.
first name, Jesus, because without that blood, we couldn't be with you, Jesus. And we just thank you for that blood applied to us all. And it's given so freely, God. Thank you, Jesus, for that blood today, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning, Vision. So good to see y'all again out there this morning. We've had some recently that were out, not feeling well, not doing well, but a lot of the names of those that we called out in prayer last week are here today, and we thank God for that. We thank God for that. You know, um, <clears throat> that song that they just sang, I guess that has been on my heart for the last couple of weeks. And I've got to where I can't hardly start a prayer of any kind, even a blessing over my food, without saying, thank you, God, for what Jesus did on the cross. Because, you know, if it hadn't have been for that, where would we be? I mean, there would just, there would be no hope for sinful old me. I don't know about y'all, but there would be no hope for me. If it wasn't for that blood that Jesus shed. And you know, that's just, that that's the most, everything hinges on that. You know, the fact that I'm able to come to God in prayer hinges on the fact that he shed that blood on the cross. And that veil that prevented all of us from getting straight to God was rent. It was ripped in two. And that way was made for us to be able to come into God's presence and talk to him and ask him things and thank him and praise him, you know. I like what McKenna said this morning. You know, we say that this is the Thanksgiving season. All year should be our Thanksgiving season. We have so much to be thankful for, you know. And, and I guess it's me getting older, but the older I get, the less real this world is to me and the more real that world is to me. I just thank God for that, you know. I'd just like to encourage y'all before we take prayer requests, if you have a chance to plant a seed with anybody, just just take that chance and plant that seed, you know. Some people may look at you like, okay, but then there may be that one that says, what was that? And they want to hear it again, and they want to hear more about it, you know. You know, I I thank God for this, this young guy that was at the tire shop the other day. I stopped at the tire shop, and bless his heart, he was the only one out there working on things. And they were just swamped. And uh, all I needed was a little bit of air in my tires, you know. And I told him, I walked up and told him what I needed. And he kind of made a way for me to kind of slip in one side over there. And he, he kind of stopped what he was doing and went and put my air in my tires. And I told him, I said, you know, I said, my husband would have taken care of this for me. But he passed away this February. He looked around and he said, well, I'm sorry about that. He was real sincere. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, I appreciate that. But I said, the thing is, we all don't know. We don't know when we're going to leave here. So the thing is to have that heart right with God every day, to have that heart right with God, you know. And I, I knew I didn't have but a second because he was rushing through that, trying to get through where he could help these other people. But when I started to walk off, I told him, I said, you know, that's not a hard thing to do, right? You know that, right? You just got to talk to him. I said, talk to him, you know? And I just prayed this weekend, you know, I said, God, let somebody come along and water that little bitty seed. I feel like it wasn't anything but a, a mustard seed, maybe that I maybe planted, you know. 
But I said, God, let somebody come along and water that seed. And I want us to all be trying to scatter a little bit of seed as we go about our lives. It don't matter where you are. If you're on Facebook, if you're in the grocery store, the tire shop, it does not matter where you are. Try to scatter a little bit of seed for God. Who's got a prayer request this morning? Yes, amen. And God's will in it because God may have something he wants to do through it. So that that's always my, my safety right there to pray, God, your will, you know. Yes, anybody else have a prayer request this morning? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's pray for safety. All right, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. remember him then yes ma'am yes let's remember Chris's arm and his MRI tomorrow we, we want to pray that if it's God's will he will heal that arm he won't have to have anything done to it praise the Lord yes sir oh okay all right all right God knows all about that don't he you know, sometimes I'm talking to God and I'll say, God, you know all about that. You know how I, how I thought or how I felt when that was happening or whatever. And he does. We need to be real with God, you know. We need to be real with him. Anybody else have a prayer request this morning? Okay. Let's remember Garrett and Alyssa. I think Alyssa's better and Garrett's coming along, but he needs prayer. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we thank you this morning, Lord, for being here in your house. We thank you for the blessings that you have given us. We thank you for what Jesus did on that cross for us, Lord. We ask you this morning, God, to just touch every request, God, according to your will, God. We know that you are able and, Lord, we put these things in your hand, and we ask you to move upon each one of them, God, as you see fit. God, the ones that are sick, the ones that need help with school, God, with their grades. God, you know the, the ones, God, that, that just need your touch today, God. And, Lord, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name and in your will. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Miss Trudy. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I kind of feel like after Miss Trudy spoke, we could just say amen and go home. Amen. Thank the Lord for Miss Trudy. Amen. Thank the Lord for McKenna and Sarah and Stephanie blessing us this morning. Amen. And let me say before we get started, I hope everyone has a really good Thanksgiving this week. Amen. I hope you enjoy uh, this time. Uh, remember to be thankful to the Lord. That is most important of all. Amen. He indeed has been good to us. Praise the Lord. Good to see all of the people back with us today that have been sick and have been able to be with us. Praise the Lord that they're doing better. Amen. Amen. How many of you brought your Bible this morning? Good, good, good. If you will, open it up to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, and come down, if you will, to verse 43. We'll be looking at verse 43 through 48, 43 through 48. My message this morning is entitled, Loving Those That You'd Rather Hate. And this is a tough one, as they have all been pretty tough. Would you agree? Amen. 
if they haven't stricken you as being tough, then then I don't know. I don't know. Amen. They have certainly been tough to me. I believe they're tough to all of us. Amen. Amen. Does everyone have it? Yes. Amen. Okay. Look at it with me. Starting with verse forty-three. You have heard it said, "You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy." But I say to you, Jesus, of course, is speaking, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Verse 46, Jesus says, For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do this? 48, last verse there. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, thank you for your precious word. It is a, it is a hard word, a difficult passage. So, Lord, we need your help today. Lord, I need it, and I pray for it, and I ask you, Lord, for your blessing, your anointing, the unction of the Holy Spirit in and, and teaching and preaching this morning. I pray, Lord, that you also would help each one of us receive it today, Lord, as if it was certainly spoken to us today by the one who spoke it 2,000 years ago. Lord, may we hear it just as fresh as they heard it there on that hillside. Lord, help us to deal with the, the difficulty of this passage. And Lord, I pray that you'd open up our hearts and minds that we'd all be able to receive it, speak to us individually, corporately as a church. And Lord, pray for your blessings on us. And Lord, I'll be so grateful to you for it. And everybody said amen, amen, amen. Now remember, this, uh, this section that we're looking at is, uh, is the Sermon on the Mount. 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, the greatest sermon ever preached. And if you picture Jesus preaching to that crowd on that hillside there around the Sea of Galilee, uh, perhaps you can put yourself there hearing these difficult words. Uh, remember that this word is one of the last ones in this chapter, of course, but it's number six of the six illustrations that Jesus was using here to, to close out chapter 5. Now, obviously, Jesus didn't say, now that's the end of chapter 5, so turn over to chapter 6, okay? Uh, obviously, that didn't happen there. This is one continual sermon. But for you and me, it closes out chapter 5 for us. But remember what this is coming after, the, the kind of springboard of these six things that I'll tell you about, remind you of in just a moment, is verse 20, where he tells the people there that unless your righteousness exceeds, gets higher, than the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And it had to be shocking to them, as you remember us talking about it, because the most religious people they knew were the ones that Jesus had just called out. And he says, you've got to be higher, exponentially higher than these guys if you want to enter into the kingdom. And so this had to be disheartening for the people because they thought if anybody would make it to heaven, it would certainly be this group of people, right? The religious leaders of the day. But what Jesus begins to do in these six illustrations that follow that is strip away layer by layer the hypocrisy of these religious leaders. And he does so by doing this. He gives the first way of doing it in these six is saying, you've heard it said. Now that is a, uh, that's a sign for me and you. That's, a, that's a kind of a little mark there for you and I to note what they were teaching. When he says, you've heard it said, he's referring to what the scribes and the Pharisees were teaching the people was what God had said. Now, that was not what God had said because Jesus comes right behind that and says what the Lord intended. He says, but I say to you. So again, there's another uh, mark for us to realize that this is what God originally said. This is what God intended. So the two are in contrast to each other. You've heard it said, what they were being taught, but I say to you what God's Word actually said. Amen? So you remember how it went in these six illustrations as he's stripping them away. The first one had to do with murder. You've heard it said, don't murder. But Jesus said, but if you have hatred in your heart, if you hate another person in your heart, before God, you're just as guilty. He goes on to the second illustration. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Don't do the outward act of adultery. But if you have lust in your heart, God looks as you as guilty. Again, 
uh, stripping away another layer. Uh, the third one had to do with divorce. What they were teaching was as long as you do a, uh, the right paperwork, you can divorce for any means necessary, Jesus takes them back. And he says if you're doing that without adultery, which is the only biblical cause, you're filling the land full of adultery. He then deals with their speech and how that in that time that they were making oaths and swearing to anything uh, with certain limitations like the, the gift on the altar or the, the gold of the temple or uh, the God of heaven. If they just used heaven or if they just swore to the temple or if they just swore to the altar, it was okay to break that. And Jesus says your conversation ought to be so that you don't have to add a swearing or a make an oath to verify, to validate what you're saying. Your yes should be yes and your no should be no. Again, stripping away another layer. And then last week, if you remember, he dealt with this idea of vindictiveness, taking vengeance on that. And how that we're told about the slapping of the cheek, about someone taking you to court, about someone uh, winning a lawsuit against you, and if you have, uh, have to give them a shirt, give them the outward coat as well. Uh, if a Roman soldier compels you to go a mile, go with him too. All of those are dealing with insults and injury that we face, not, not things designed to, to break your bones or put you in the hospital, but, but insults, that, that injurious type insult that we, that we deal with. Amen? Amen. Now, Number six, the last one on that list is where he's going to be dealing with the one who actually brings that insult to you. The one that injures you in that way. Last week was the, the injury itself, okay? Again, the back slap, uh, the court case, and the, the compelling, getting you to go two miles with them. Now it's dealing with the person that causes that. How are we to react toward the person who is our enemy? Now let's define a few things here this morning. What is an enemy? An enemy would be, biblically, one that either wishes you harm or does you harm. Okay? They wish you ill. In other words, they'd like to see some, some ill come toward you, some, some wrong come, come toward you, or they actually bring it about themselves. So it's not just the outward act of doing something to you. It's the wish for that, the desire for something to come your way. Amen? Is everybody with me? Now, with that being said... What about us? What about us wishing that something would befall on somebody that's not good? Amen. What about us having a desire to see one uh, experience some kind of a, a problem in their life? Would not that also make us an enemy? Amen? So this is really difficult, isn't it? Right? Let's look at this verse, if you will, again, uh, verse 43. Again, this opens it up just like he had been doing. You have heard it was said. This is what they're being taught. The Pharisees, the scribes were teaching this way. You shall love your neighbor. Now that is biblical, by the way. In Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18, you will find this right here. Love your neighbor. Okay, so they're pulling straight out of the, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the Old Testament, the Law of Moses. And, but what they're doing, though, attaching to that the exact opposite. And what is that? That you shall hate your enemy. By the way, that is not in Scripture. So what have they been taught? The people there are being taught by the religious leaders one thing that is valid, loving your neighbor, but the other that is exactly contrary to God's will and God's word, which is to hate your enemy. The religious leaders, these uh, scribes and these Pharisees, were given the people a justification to hate. So what does Jesus do in verse 44? But I say to you, putting it back to the level where it's supposed to be, God's Word is saying, remember this is the Word, this is God incarnate, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, amen. This is the Word of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same, the Word, Jesus, was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Who? The Word. And was not anything made that was made. Who? Jesus, the Word. So when Jesus says, I say to you, understand this is like God Himself speaking because it is God, Jesus Christ, the Son, the second person of the Trinity speaking to them. And what does He say? Love. Not your neighbors, but your enemy. This is what's so hard about this, amen? 
Someone read this, not a Christian person, but many years ago read this statement, this particular section of this, and exclaimed out of shock, either Christ did not say that, or we, speaking about the people there that was in that church, we are not Christians. Think about that. Either Christ didn't say that, or we as followers are not Christians, because in his estimation, what? We aren't doing this. Amen. You see, loving our neighbors is not hard. If you like somebody that likes you, that's not hard. Amen. If you love somebody that loves you back, that's not hard. You do good to somebody that does good for you, that's not hard. No. You are a beneficiary towards someone who is uh, doing you good, doing well, treating you nice, that's not hard. Amen? That's not a challenge. Anyone can do that. What is hard is, is what he says here, to love those who, as an enemy, wishes something bad upon me, would like for something bad to happen to me, maybe would say, I hope this happens to you in a negative way, or actually physically does something negative to me. They are my enemy. And let's just be honest here. We all have enemies. Amen? This is to be taken in a, in a sense of, of understanding that, that we all have enemies. Even Jesus had enemies. Was he someone else's enemy? Absolutely not. But did he not have enemies? Yes. Yes. It was his enemies that put him on the cross. Amen. Well, we look at this and we say, well, you know, this is just, uh, as people have throughout the century, look, this is not feasible. This is just not real. Uh, Jesus could not expect us to, to actually love people that hate us, love people that do us wrong, love people that wish ill to come upon us. Uh, you, this is just too much of an ideal that you can't really expect a person that lives in real life to be able to do this. I will take you back to what Jesus did in Luke chapter 23. We have a picture there of Jesus and the Romans had just done something tremendously evil to Jesus. They had taken his body and stretched his arms out, took these huge spikes and with a sledgehammer drove them through his wrist one to one cross side of the bar, the other to the other bar. They took his feet, they, they stretched them out, but then they pushed them up slightly so they would not be able to rest and then drove a spike through his ankles, piercing both his feet. And then he picked him up through a hole that had already been dug and let it drop down. And that when it hit bottom, you can imagine the shock that it would send throughout his bones and his muscles, his tendons, even tearing the flesh. They'd already whipped him, turned his body to shreds, spit on him, cursed him, beat him in the face, ripped out his beard. And then at his feet, of course, were the Jews that were there that were screaming for his blood. The Jews had done him ill. They had put him through these mock trials that were illegal at night. They had brought false witnesses before him. They accused Jesus, our Lord, who had never done anything but good for anybody. They accused him of being a blasphemer. They had beaten Jesus himself. They had mocked Jesus themselves. And there, him hanging on the cross for them, what were they doing? They were like a mob, screaming in a frantic type of a way, for his blood. And what did Jesus do? Jesus there petitioned the Father on their behalf. And he prayed, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And at that time, they were still at his feet. Trying to cast lots for the only thing that Jesus had of value, which was his seamless robe. At that very moment, what was he doing? He was petitioning God for them. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, that's Jesus, oh Rick. That, that's, that's the Son of God. I agree with you, yeah. That's exactly who that is. And you might would say, well, a person couldn't do that. That's no way. I could expect Jesus, you know. He's perfect, but not a regular person. They couldn't do that. Well, I would point you then to Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, as the church is growing now, Christ is already... Uh, return to heaven, Acts chapter 2, the, what we call the birthday of the church. The church is getting started there with that phenomenal sermon by Peter on the day of Pentecost. And we have in Acts chapter 7 a, a young believer, a man by the name of Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost, full of faith. 
And he's serving in the church. He knew all about the Old Testament. He was very, very knowledgeable about that, as well as the New Covenant. So here's a good Christian man serving in church, full of the Spirit, full of faith. And he stands up there and he gives a phenomenal sermon there. Not unlike Peter's in Acts chapter 2, where he indicts the Israel for all of their sins, going throughout their history. And at the end of that sermon, the people begin to scream and they, they, they put their hands over their ears so they won't hear him anymore. And they condemn that man, Stephen, to death. Now the way that the, the Jews would carry out death was they would take a person, uh, they had to stone them, but they would take the person first and they'd throw them off some type of a precipice, about 10 foot tall at least, you know. They'd throw them off of that, and then the first accuser would take a big stone and do their best to try to crush that skull of that person. Then the second accuser would come behind them, try to do what the first person may or may not have done, and then the mob would come after that second accuser and try to finish off that deal and crush the life of that person. Now they took Stephen. They threw him over that, this cliff, if you will, and began to stone him. And the Bible says that he begins to pull himself to a position, if you will, picture it with me, to a kneel. And what does he do? This man being pelted by these stones from these people that hated him. He what? Prays for them. Amen. Father, do not lay this sin to their charge. Amen. Wow. Wow. That's Stephen. Now Stephen, God did man, but Stephen was not Jesus. Was he not a man like you and me? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So this is not something that is impossible. This is not something that is only reserved for Jesus, only reserved for the, for the super, super, super saints. No, this is something that God wants us as people of the kingdom to also do. Amen. You see, this way of the world is to hate those that hate us. It is to hate our enemies. And so what the Jewish teachers were doing for the people in that day was giving them a license, a justification for hate. And they hated. Boy, they did they hate. They hated every person that was not an Israelite. If you were a Roman, they certainly hated you. You were occupying their land. You were making them walk a mile to carry their suitcase, right? You were doing all kinds of things against them. So they certainly hated the Romans. They hated the tax collectors because the tax collectors were, were being uh, exploitive toward their fellow Jews working for the Romans. So they hated them. And they certainly, certainly hated every Gentile. To them, the Gentile was only created to fuel the fires of hell. So these people were given a license to their hate, you see. And so when Jesus said, no, you're not to hate your enemies, but you are to love your enemies. As strong as it is for us today, it was as strong for them in that day as well. Because it was going not only against their conscience, Okay, to, to naturally want to hate someone, but also their religious teaching. They were getting religious teaching. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine coming to a church service and a pastor like me standing up and saying, hey, it's okay to hate everybody who's not your neighbor. And if you were being taught this over and over and over, this indoctrination coming into you, you say, wow, you know, I'm doing the right thing by God. I'm hating those who don't like me. I'm hating those that say bad things about me, and I'm okay with God by that. Can you imagine receiving that? And this is what they were getting. Jesus is trying to correct that with this last nail on a coffin, if you will, trying to show them something, that you guys think that you're right with God. You Pharisees, you scribes, you think you're all right with God. This is to show them this is how far you are from reaching rightness with God. He's attacking their very love. Your love is selective. Your love is very narrow. And your love is only for those that, that you want to love, only for those that love you back. Jesus said, no, it's not, not to be that at all. Your love is to accomplish everyone, not just everyone, but even those who are your enemies. That's how broad love is supposed to be. And when we look at that, we ourselves, we have to realize, wow, many times myself, I can't speak for you, fall so short of that. And when we realize that, we also realize just how far we are of missing God's mark. Amen. Keep in mind, as Jesus is saying that to these people, he had really a twofold purpose because in his audience there on that hillside would have been two types of people, just like there is in, in, today, just like 
I may be speaking to two types of people today. Two types of people may be watching this. The first type would be the person that, that really isn't the Christ follower. With Jesus there, there were people that were just inquisitive. People that were, obviously the scribes were there, the Pharisees, there were some of them that was there. But there may have been some of the s and some of the zealots. Uh, there may have been some of the Sadducees there for all we know. Now they didn't want to follow Christ, but they were there to what? To gather intel, to get information, to try to, to do something against this person. If we can get some stuff and, and persecute him with this stuff, what he's saying, trip him up, then we'll have some ammunition against destroying him. So they weren't there to, to, to follow Jesus. They were there to indict Jesus. Amen? So as they're hearing this message, as Jesus is saying this, they would realize something that, hey, I don't love like that. He's saying that the, the kingdom way is what? To love your enemies. Well, they did not love like that, and they couldn't love like that. So what did that show? It showed them that they were a sinner. They were missing God's mark. And what does a sinner need most? A sinner needs a Savior. And he will reveal himself as that Savior throughout his ministry. Amen? So for the sinner that's hearing that, not the Christ follower, but for the, for the average person who's not a Christian hearing that, it shows them just how high the standard is. It shows them that although they may think that they're okay, they may think they've constructed some type of a system that they can go into God's heaven, that God's requirement is so much higher than what they're presently doing that they miss the mark, they're a sinner, they're in need of a Savior. There's another group too as well who are the followers of Christ. These are those that have decided to follow Jesus. They've dedicated their lives to Jesus. The disciples were there, remember that. So they'd already made that decision to, to be with Jesus, to follow Him. But what they also would realize, these disciples hearing that, is like many of you and I would hear, that many times we miss that mark. And we would realize that, you know, I'm a follower of Christ. I've dedicated my life to following Christ. And so many times I, I miss this portion. So many times I, I miss the mark. I fall short of this particular mark that Jesus is talking about there. As well as the others he's been preaching in this sermon. And what does that show? It shows me that this is an exhortation to what? To fall in line, to, to obey this command, to, to get things back on track to where they're supposed to be. Amen? And so many times we may forget this teaching of Jesus and think that we can justify our hatred, we can justify this for some person because of the way they treated us, because of what they did to us, what they didn't do to us, maybe what they said about us, directly or indirectly. Amen? Now, believe me, I'm not trying to belittle what someone's done to you because I'm certain that everyone in here probably has had something ugly happen to you or something ugly said to you, as have I. Amen? And we could all, you know, have our little pity party and, and talk about those things, right? And try to justify our feelings of hatred toward that, right? But in those things that we do, don't we always, at least me, don't we always kind of uh, soften our part of that yes. and, and build up the antagonism of the other person, yes. right? Don't we always, at least I do, you know, we try to, you know, minimize all my things, you know, that I had to do with that and magnify the other person's fault, right? And in doing that, we find some kind of justification for ill will or ill thoughts or hatred toward another person, an enemy. Jesus says, what? No, you are to love your enemy. Amen. Loving your neighbor. You remember the story that Jesus told in the parable about the Good Samaritan? When the man was wanting to know, who is my neighbor? Love your neighbor. Who, can I, who is it I'm supposed to love? Can I pick them people out, those people, and say that they're a neighbor? And Jesus tells the story. You remember the story. Uh, very briefly, you remember that this man had fell among thieves and was injured there. He's on this road where the priest and the Levites travel. Very quickly, you remember that the, the priest come first and passed by on the other way. Wouldn't help the man, the fellow Jew. The priest, excuse me, the Levite, who was a helper to the priest, come by, did the same thing. And then the man's arch enemy come by, the Samaritan. The Jews and the Samaritans hated each other from their very existence. Amen? And what does he do? He comes... He puts oil and wine on the man's bandages. He picks him up, puts him on his own donkey or whatever, takes him to an end, puts him up, says, I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to come back. Does all these things. Goes out of the way. Sacrifices his time. He sacrifices his money. 
He sacrifices all these things, his care, all for the benefit of this person. And the question is, Jesus says, well, who was this man's neighbor? Who is this man that he's talking about? This man is a man who's injured. Who is a man who was injured's neighbor? It was a man who come across his path that was willing to help. Amen. And so then the question then comes about to me and you, you know, it's not for me and you to try to pick out who our neighbor is. That way I can be neighborly toward them but to be a neighbor always and decide that whoever I come in contact with, whoever's in my path, I'm going to show them neighborly love. I'm going to be the neighbor. Amen? Amen? But we understand that pretty much. But the difficulty is, is when loving our enemies. There was a Christian counselor that uh, had a businessman come to see him. And uh, he told, the, he just by himself, he told the Christian counselor there, he said, uh, I come to you because I've got a dilemma. And he said, well, what's the dilemma? He said, well, I want to divorce my wife. And he says, well, why? Has she been unfaithful? No, nothing like that. Uh, has she done something else? No, nothing like that. Well, why do you want to divorce your wife? He said, I just can't stand her. Just can't stand her. He said, well, I don't understand. He said, you don't, you don't get what I'm saying. I, I can't stand her. I don't want to be around her. I hate the sight of her. And the Christian counselor says, well, I, 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 you're supposed to be a believer, right? Yeah. Well, the Bible says to love your wives like Christ loved the church. You don't have a choice in the matter. You have to. And a man says, you do not understand. I don't even want to be in the same room with her. And so the Christian counselor very wisely told him, he said, well, I'll tell you what, let's just do something. Do an experiment. He said, I want you to just kind of do a temporary separation, and I want you to move out of the house and move next door. Do that for about three or four weeks. And the man who's wanting the divorce, you know, he's looking at the counselor, he said, well, what good would that would do? Well, the Bible says to love your neighbor. <laughs> so you will become effectually a neighbor if you move out of the house. And the man says, you're not listening to me. I hate her with all of my guts. I despise her. And the Christian counselor said, well, are you saying that perhaps she's your enemy yeah yeah she she's my greatest enmity is toward her and the christian counselor looked at me and said well you know the bible says to what love your enemy i think the man probably got a different counselor after that you know <laughs> not quite sure look at this with me if you will jesus says these words about love so what type of love are we talking about there what is Jesus expecting from us? There's, there's different types of love in the Bible. You've heard of talked about before. We've spoken about them, but remember them with me. The first one we talk about is the word phileo. Now, when I say different types of love in the Bible, when you open your Bible, you won't see phileo. You'll see the word love, four-letter word love. All of these I'm going to describe to you, and these four in our English Bible are translated love, but they're not that way in the Greek, okay? So if we had a Greek translation or if we had an interlinear Bible, uh, keyword Bible, something like that, you would see these words defined differently because they are different in the Greek. But in our English, it's love. We say love like I love a moon pie, like I do love my wife. There are different types of love, right? Amen? Everybody with me this morning? Uh, phileo is, is brotherly, brotherly love. The city of Philadelphia named after that. It's how we have friendship, affection toward another. Amen? The other is storge, Greek word. Again, translated love. It's a family type of love. It's a love that brothers and sisters, you know, in the same family, you know, blood related. Uh, fathers love their children. Mothers love their sons, love their daughters. That type of familiar family love. Okay, that's storge. There's the other love that's eros. It's the erotic love. It's the love of affection. The love that a husband has for his wife, a wife has for her husband. Jesus is not talking about any of those there. He doesn't use storge. He doesn't use eros. He doesn't use phileo. He's, he's not expecting us to have a, a friendship type of love with our enemy. He's not expecting us to have a brotherly, sisterly love with our enemies. He's not expecting us to have a eros type of love, of course, with our enemies. What's the word that Jesus uses? He uses the word agapheo, which is what? It's a love 
that is what we characterize as God love, but it's the love that wants to see the benefit for another person. Again, he doesn't expect you to be best friends to your enemy. Doesn't expect you to have that, you know, that, that brotherly love or that erotic love, but that love that desires the very best for that individual. Now, we have this kind of showed to us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So if you will turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know, we've called this chapter, not original with me, of course, but scholars, teachers call this the love chapter. And that's indeed what it is. It's talking about agape. Now, Jesus exemplified this, if you remember in John uh, chapter 13, I believe it is, where Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. And uh, the cross is, you know, coming. I mean, it's, he's right there in the doorstep of the cross. He's let them know uh, he's going to be leaving them. Instead of them being concerned for Jesus, instead of them being compassionate about what he's about to go through, you know what the disciples are doing? These ornery bunch of argumentative guys that are so selfish are arguing about who's going to be first in the kingdom. They have no regard, really, at that moment for Jesus and what he's about to go through. So he's not doing this, not saying what I'm about to tell you he's going to say to these disciples because they're the most loving, the most generous, the most giving type of guys out there. But what does he do to those men? He takes a water basin and a towel and he begins to wash their nasty, smelly feet. And then you know what he tells them a little bit later in that chapter? As I have loved you, love one another. You see, this is a love that's... this. Uh, this love, agape, is a, the love that does service. It loves well-being for someone else. It's, it's a verb. It's action. Amen? Yeah. It's love in action. Jesus washing their feet, doing a service for them. The greater for the lesser, in a way. In a tremendous way, but the lesson is a, in, a, in a way. But Paul, later on in 1 Corinthians 13, kind of explains this love to you and me. Come down, if you will, to verse, uh, verse 4. Does everybody have it? 1 Corinthians chapter um, 13, verse 4. That's what he says here. He says the first one is this. Love is patient. Does everybody see that? Now notice this. This is all in a verbal form. Uh, dynamic. Action. Love is patient. It literally means long-tempered. Long-tempered. Used with patience with people. So what Jesus is talking about there in Matthew chapter 5, we are to see how I'm supposed to treat my enemy. I'm supposed to act toward them. I'm patient with them. Patient with people. He goes on to say, love is kind. The word kind in the Greek is the word for useful. In other words, love sets itself up to do kindness toward people that will, in a way, be useful to them. Again, we're not talking about something that's reciprocated back to us. Maybe that will be the case, but it's not dependent upon that. It's not dependent upon them being kind to me that I reciprocate that back. Are you following me? Amen. He goes on to say, love does not envy. That means it doesn't have a competitive spirit. It is not jealous. It has joy whenever there's another person's success. Oh, we're talking about hard things, aren't we? When we see our enemy have success, and we are supposed, according to the Scripture, to have joy. Yes, this is kingdom love we're talking about. This is not the love of the world. The love of the world can't love like this. But we're a part of the kingdom, aren't we? We, are, we have decided to follow Jesus, haven't we? Don't we have something that the world does not have? Yes, yes. I've been forgiven, yes. I've become a, a child of God, a son or a daughter of God, if you're a lady in here, amen? Don't we have another person living inside of us? Yes, yes. The very embodiment of this love. And so I do have the, the power and the ability to love in this way. Correct? Without God, I can't. With Him, I can 
if I permit him to love through me, if I put self to death, because self wants to do what? You hurt me, I want to hurt you back. You say something bad to me, I want to say something right back bad to you, right? Amen? That's natural. You don't have to work at that. That's easy. The sacrificing self, putting self to death, you know, squelches that. And said, no, no, that's not the kingdom way. That's not God's way. Jesus has commanded me to love my enemies. So love is patient. Love is kind. It's not boastful, he goes on to say. I think the, the Greek word there has to do with outward bragging, okay, outward uh, showing off and stuff like that. Being a person that's conceited, that's not love. It goes on to say love is not puffed up. Uh, the inside, inward, big-headed, self-centered type of a thing. That's not love. It's love. So love is not self-centered. It's patient toward people. It's kind. doesn't have a competitive spirit. Not jealous. Never envies anybody else's position. Now look at verse 5, if you will, with me. Love does not behave rudely or, or unseemly. Always considerate. Always concerned with somebody else. Always tender in dealing with people. Even evil people. Even people who are enemies. It's amazing, isn't it? That's the way love is supposed to act. Love seeks not its own. In other words, seeks not its own. In other words, it's not selfish. It's unselfish. Always seeking the things of others. Love is not provoked. That means that it, it doesn't have a sudden outburst of anger or rage. It doesn't react to injury by temper. It doesn't have these outbursts based upon temper. Love thinks no evil. It always imagines the best about people. Always wants to think, think the very best. You know, I think as far as human people go, my wife exemplifies this to me. Always thinking about, you know, uh, someone's best. Always, you know, thinking the intentions are always on the best. You always sides toward the best. Amen? I wish I could be more like that. God wants me to be more like that. It always forgets and forgives. Never carries a grudge. Never defensive. Never eager to blame somebody else. That's what love is. Look at verse 6. Love rejoices not in iniquity. That means it never takes pleasure when a person, another person, falls into sin or gets caught in some, some type of a corrupt thing like that. In other words, they never take pleasure in that. It rejoices in truth. That means love is positive. It's encouraging. Look at verse 7. Love, there's four things here. It bears all things. It believes all things, it hopes all things, and it endures all things. When it says love bears all things, it's a word that means to cover something. Like a blanket or, or like a, a sheet. It means to, to blanket other people's faults. Instead of uncovering them and bringing them out, let me tell you what they've done. It's what? Let me see if I can cover that, that fault. Wow. Believes all things, it's never suspicious, always believes the best, hopes all things, even when there's a failure. It has the optimism to believe that something better is going to happen. It's going to be a change. Doesn't believe that the failure is going to be the final thing. You follow me, yes? And then love endures all things. Love never fails. What a tremendous picture. Just in, And the whole chapter is a love chapter, but we just took three verses. And that's the type of love. You see, all those are active. All those in, in the verbal form toward how we are to react toward our enemies. I told you this was tough before we got started, didn't I? There was a, um, a man, a uh, missionary man that went to a place over in the uh, area of the Polynesian, and he saw in their huts... They had these, you know, just huts. Couldn't really consider them to be houses. But on their huts, they had uh, bands of string uh, hanging from the roof with all these little trinkets 
Okay, all kind of different various things hanging from the roof by, by this rope. And the, the guy that was there said, you know, what are these things that you've got hanging off the roof? And they said, well, these are for remembrance. And what are you talking about? Well, when somebody does us wrong, when somebody does ill toward us, we fashion something to remember that ill by, and we hang it on the roof so we'll never forget it. So every time we see that, we're always reminded of what this person has done because this brings back to our mind the ill that they brought toward us. We're, we remember the person, we remember what happened, and we never forget it. We never take it down, and there's total vengeance upon that individual. That's the only time it's taken down. And you see, the Pharisees had in their own little self-righteous huts all these things that they put around toward everybody that had done them some type of injury, some type of ill. And they hated those people like that. And they were teaching the other people, you need to hate like that as well. What a terrible way to live. Would you agree? Well, he goes on to say this. Uh, coming back to Matthew 5. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Now that doesn't mean to pray like David did in the precatory Psalms. Lord, break their teeth. Lord, crush their bones. That's not what he's talking about there, by the way. Amen? Amen? Okay. He's talking about what? To pray for their benefit. To pray for their good. Are you, are you realizing just how tough this is? Just how, how high of a calling this is? Amen? This is the kingdom way. Pray for those that spitefully use you and persecute you. Verse 45. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Now what is this talking about? This is not talking about so that you'll be saved. Not that you'll be become a son and daughter of God. No. But that you'll be recognized as a son or daughter of God. Uh, sometimes I, I see some of uh, people that know my dad and uh, they don't know me. They know my dad and they may know my name but they never met me and they see me and they said, you got to be Glenn Hart, son. You know, you look just like him. All right? Well, what are they, what are they putting together? They're putting together what? The resemblance. Correct? You see, there's no greater resemblance that we have in this world that we live in than when we show kindness to someone who has not showed kindness to us. There's no greater test of Christian character. The, the test of Christian character doesn't have anything to do with how you treat your friends. The true test of Christian character has to do with how you treat those who are your enemies. And you see, when someone does that, when someone treats a person who has their ill in mind in a beneficial way, in a loving way, they realize that's not that person. There's someone else <laughs> involved in that. There, there's something inside of them that's different than me. I love to hear some of the old stories, and I sometimes I tell you guys about, about the, many of the Christian martyrs in times past. Uh, one guy's name actually was... Uh, New art. And uh, he was a believer in Christ. He wouldn't renounce it. And because he wouldn't renounce Christ, his Christianity, he was sentenced to death. And so they, they took him to the place of execution. Going to remove his head from his body. Now this man was a, a, an exemplary Christian. And his faithfulness to the Lord and to his Christianity was well known. Even the executioner knew about it. Keep that in mind. Here's a guy that makes his living literally by killing people. And whenever he learned that he was going to have to execute this man, he hesitated. And the man that was bent over there, you know, ready for it to take place, he had resolved that he was going to die. He, he felt the hesitation of the executioner. He stood up to his feet. He turned around. He embraced his executioner. And he planted a kiss on the executioner's cheek. And he says, let this be a token that I have forgiven you. 
Wow. I read about another gentleman that was to be apprehended by a band of soldiers for his faith. They came in there, they pointed guns at his head. That man who was just about to lose his life, biographer writes about him, that he began to talk to those people, had those guns pointed at his head about Jesus, and began to pray for them. And here's the astounding thing. Every one of those men in there, Frank, gave their life to Christ right there. Amen. Amen. You see, that's what's so unusual. You're so different than the world, right? Amen. Amen. It has a tremendous lasting impact. Amen. There was a, a story that I heard R.C. Sproul talk about several years back. Um, he went to a funeral of an Episcopalian priest. And the priest didn't have a diocese. He didn't have a, uh, anything like that. But what they did, he was a part of, was something called the Pittsburgh Experiment. But many years ago, this man uh, who they were having a funeral for had had a sudden heart attack at the age of 40. And uh, it had shocked everybody because of his young age, because of the, the, uh, the, the quickness of everything that took place. And they had a tremendous funeral service for him. And they had all of the Episcopalian priests that were there, and they were a part of the choir. And they were singing these songs there that would just move you to tears hearing these men, these priests, sing about this one that was their brother who had departed. Even though he didn't have a parish, he didn't have a church, he was just part of this thing called the Philadelphia Experiment. Now, here's what the Philadelphia Experiment was, and th that gives you the story of this man. Uh, it was started by a man by the name of Schumacher, Sam Schumacher. And what he decided to do was to go out into the, the business world and have a place where businessmen would come and meet once a week. And he would, um, he would give them a, you know, a lesson in the scripture, give them a devotion, have prayer with them, and then he would challenge them. This was a challenge of the Philadelphia, uh, Pittsburgh experiment, excuse me. Was it, they would take their most heinous enemy, the one who was the highest on the list of their list of enemies in these business world, and they would say, I want you to pray every day for that person for 30 days. Well, the, the one that they were having the funeral for that particular day, he had come to one of these reluctantly, kicking and screaming there. Uh, he was a retired Marine drill sergeant. Tell you a little bit more about the type of uh, disposition he would have. And he heard this. He heard this challenge. And he says to take the highest enemy that you've got, your most gruesome enemy, and pray for them for 30 days. He stood up. And he had a few choice words that we can't repeat here, but he says, you know, I'd like to meet the blankety-blank guy that wants me to pray for my enemy for 30 days. Well, Sam Schumacher heard this gentleman, of course, and he said, sir, he said, that may be so, but I want to challenge you. He said, I want to challenge you to do that. 30 days, and you come back here in 30 days, and let's see how it went. Well, he, of course, not going to back down from the challenge and uh, very forcefully objected to that, but... He decided he would do it. He went home and he prayed for 30 days. He'd come back, believe it or not, and then he'd come back the next month. And then he'd come back the next month. And you know what happened? That man became a believer, got converted to Christianity, and became one of the directors of the Pittsburgh experiment there. And it was that man, you see, who had passed away at the age of 30 as a director of the Pittsburgh experiment. They were having the funeral for. Can people lives be changed? Absolutely. Can it be transformed by Christ? Absolutely. Amen. You see, what happens whenever we pray for someone who, who is our or despitefully uses us, meaning for, you know, they're using us for ill will or ill toward us, it washes us in a way. It cleanses us. Someone comes to you, maybe, you know, uh, scenario and they say you know what I want to talk to you about so and so you know and they they so and so did this to me you know what you should do what what I would encourage you to do tell that person that's telling you that why don't you pray for them yeah they did this I, I heard you but, but here, here's my challenge to you why don't you begin to pray for that person and you know when you begin to pray for that person it does the same thing that it did for this gentleman that Mr. Schumacher was talking to. It begins to wash you internally. Amen? Amen. It begins, as you pray for that person, as you lift them up to the Lord, 
you know what? You begin to change. You begin to be thoroughly cleansed on the inside. And whenever that takes place, when all that bitterness, that anger, that resentment gets, gets flushed away as you're praying for them, you know what happens? You're able then to show that person the love. You're able to show them these outward acts. Let me, let me close with this here and, and maybe bring it all to a conclusion, hopefully. Um, we'll pick up on the rest of it next week, Lord willing. Amen. A Japanese emperor found out about a little small band of men that were becoming insurgents upon this little territory there. He had these emissaries that come and told him all these things, you know, and, and the emperor said, uh, gather all the men. We're going to, to exterminate our enemy at once. And so them, of course, you know, gathered up all these great number of soldiers and they traveled over to this little small little village there where this insurrection had started. And immediately, immediately when they saw the emperor, they surrendered. Just the sight of the emperor coming to their little place, you know, just completely squelched the insurrection there. Well, the people that were with the emperor thought that he would put them all to death. You know, they were ready to take all their lives because they had rebelled against the emperor. You know what the emperor did? He had a meal prepared for those guys. He went around and began to talk to those guys to kind of, you know, just be loving toward those people. And his, his, soul, his generals and all, they could not understand it. They went to the emperor and said, you said we were going to exterminate those enemies of yours. And the emperor said, we have. We have. You see, because I have made my enemies my friends. Praise the Lord. Are, are you challenged by these heavy words of Jesus? I know I am. Because it is a challenge. Don't misunderstand it. It is meant to challenge it. It is meant to to show me and you something internally. When we have these feelings well up inside of us, someone, you know, says something to us and these feelings begin to well up all of a sudden, you know, that's your sign that the old nature is still alive. And it's up to us at that point. Will I let that old man, will I let him speak his mind? Will I let him have his way? What did Paul say? Paul said, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Yeah. You see, when I, when I let the old man have his way, I've, I've, I've surrendered. I've lost the battle. I've been overcome by evil, you see. Right. And it is a battle. The battle is to squelch that part. Not allow that to, to rule. Not to allow that to win. But to overcome that, to be victorious over that, and to win that battle by what? By love. Amen. Not thinking that you're going to be best friends. Not thinking that you're going to be united in brotherhood. But that you are going to do these action things that we saw in 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to do these acts of service on their behalf. And you see, when you do that, there is going to be a tremendous change in you, first of all. In you. When this first gets accomplished in you and you see that you actually could do it by the power of God and the Holy Spirit enabling you to do it, it's going to be a, a, a brand new thing if you haven't ever done it before. It's going to be brand new. Wow, I didn't know this could actually work in me. This is so opposite of me. Amen. Then you know it's not you. Not something you mustered up on your own. But it's God living and working through you. And if he can do that with this person, he can do it with another, he can do it in another, and another, and another. Amen. Your life has changed. That other person, they're being transformed by what they're seeing taking place because it's unlike anything they've ever experienced. Amen? Amen. And that is a testimony to them about you being a Christian. You see, one of the biggest hindrances to Christianity, you've heard it said before, is Christians. Did you know that? You ever heard anybody say, oh, I wouldn't ever come to church that's full of hypocrites? You tell them, well, yeah, there's room for one more, though. Right? <laughs> Amen? Why is it? Because, you see, 
Jesus gives us His standard. And many times we don't obey that standard. And the world sees us as just somebody else that's not doing what Christ has told them to do. And they don't think Christianity is real. They don't think it can really change a person. They don't think a person can really be transformed because we're not doing what Christ has said we are to do. We're not being obedient Amen. to His Word. Amen. Amen. But when we are, when we are, when we have resolved to do what He says and we do that which He's commanded us to do, that shows that person that God really is real. He really does exist. He can do a work in somebody's life. Amen? May it be that in me. May it be that in you too. Amen? Praise God. Will you take that challenge this morning? Amen? Praise God. Praise God. Lord, we thank you so much for our time together this morning and thank you for your precious word. Uh, Lord, indeed it is hard. and We thank you for helping us today with it, Lord. Pray that you would, would enable us that we would examine each situation or perhaps we would take part of this experiment we've spoken about this morning. Or perhaps we would pray for one who is our greatest enemy, inflicted our greatest hurt that we've experienced. Or we commit to be praying for them, praying for their good, praying that they would be blessed. And Lord, that you would do a tremendous work inside of us, enabling us to do that, not just for one, but for all. Lord, may your transforming work that's doing its work on the inside be apparent on the outside. Lord, may we be those people who resemble Jesus Christ. May when others see us, they see you living in us. Lord, I pray that this morning for all of us. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace. We pray over this coming week, a week of thanksgiving. We ask your blessings on this, Lord, and we give you thanks for all that is done for us and for others. And we ask it in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen.